Sorry, skill issue. Okay, there it goes. Hi, my name's Asa. Um, I'm a fourth year. Uh, I'm almost out of here, thank God. People have started calling me Unk. Um, I'm in the honors program. I'm from Austin. Um, I've been on the CCDC team for four years, and uh, I'm going to work at Security Risk Advisors. Uh, hello, I'm Justin. I'm a third year CSEC student from Fullerton, California. I am the captain of the CCDC team. Um, I also work for CAB, so if you like our events, you can thank me. And if you don't like our events, I don't actually plan any of them, so yell at someone else. Um, I had my co-op over the summer at Tavora. It's a consulting place, and I enjoy cooking, sports, and video games, and the Dodgers are winning the World Series. Hello, everyone. My name is G. I am a second year CSEC student uh, from Las Vegas, Nevada. No, I do not live in a casino. <laughs> um, I do mostly cloud and networking for the CCDC team. And this summer, I interned at AWS, which I thankfully got a return offer. So I'll be back next summer. Um, yes, I am doing three minors. Uh, which is why, I don't know why, but some people describe me as he cray cray. I don't know why, just, yeah. What? No. Sorry, the people of Rochester cannot drive at all. Um, hi, I'm Zach. I'm a fifth year BSMS student. Uh, I formerly worked for the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, I now work for the Secret Service. I was the former ICSCA, former CTFCA, formerly a CCDC member, and I'm a red teamer. Why do I have the next one? All right, so what is a red versus blue competition? So it pits blue teamers, who will be primarily a lot of you guys in this room, against uh, a team of red teamers that we have here at RIT usually, if not, it's going to be alumni or things like that. Um, so you're given a network that's designed usually by a black or a gray team to defend. Uh, there's a lot of systems on there, a lot of different services you probably have to keep up and running. There might be some unique things here or there that you have to keep track of, but yeah. Um, a lot of the times there's a scoring engine that'll tell you whether or not the checks are up and down, which is another name for the services. You'll also be given injects to do, which is usually make a user, keep track of the stuff. We'll talk about those later. But they're usually just like business things that you would quote unquote normally have to do. Uh, there's a lot of different roles you fulfill inside of the competition. A lot of them are you're doing a lot of system ad administrative stuff. You're doing a lot of auditing. You're doing a lot of threat hunting. Uh, depending on the competition, you're doing incident response as well. And 99% of the time, in red versus blue competitions, red team will pre-bake, which means they will have a heads up to deploy their tools on your system. Uh, sometimes it's not that way. I think nationals for CCDC will sometimes not pre-bake, but that's because they're a lot of the time they're insane, where it does not matter what you do. Yeah, so, all right. So when you start a blue team competition, one of the first things you do is called a five minute plan. And this is probably one of the most pivotal parts of the competition, just because you need to know what services you're working with and what services are running on which machines. So the five minute plan, you will basically take an inventory of what's running. And usually, you'll prepare scripts or other tooling to um, automatically deploy basic security defenses on the entire infrastructure. So some things, some other important things in your five-minute plan is enabling your monitoring tools. So make sure logging is on. Make sure you know how to track what's happening on uh, each service so that you can later defend it down the line. And also taking backups, because Red Team loves to either delete or just move, straight up move your services to another location. Like, gee, PFSense is usually on var HTML www, 
and it's just randomly an opt. Um, your five minute plan should, like I said, be five minutes. It should be quick and easily movable to other services. Um, make sure you run it, because if you don't, you might get a giant lobster dancing across your screen and everything's in Polish. So, <laughs> um, plenty of resources out there on how to prepare five minute plans, but getting a firewall up and baselining is the most important thing. All right, so the five most important things for a blue team competition, the first one is changing your passwords. Change your passwords at the start of the competition. Change your passwords when you find red team activity. Change your passwords at the start of every day. Change just for fun. Change your passwords a lot. Um, it's number one for a reason. And yeah, make sure the scored user's password is up to date. So in the scoring engine, for a lot of services, you will have a password for a score check. For example, this is like how you would log in to SSH or FTP, um, how you would log in to like any remote service. So if you don't update the scoring engine password, then um, users will not be able to log in for the score check and your service will be down even if everything works. Um, do your injects. Injects are usually a very big portion of the scoring for a competition. For most events, I think it's like 50%, so it's very important that you do injects. Um, so these can be things like Zach mentioned, adding a user, configuring services, anything. But the most important thing is that you submit an inject on time. Even if you can't get it done, you submit something that says like, this is how we would have done it, but we ran into these issues. No matter what you submit, make sure you submit something so you can get some credit. Another thing is check the scoring engine when a service goes down. So the scoring engine will have some information about what is making the service go down and why it's not working. Um, so this is a very good place to start debugging when something gets read. And the most important thing is to have fun. That's why we're here. So some other notes to keep in mind. Um, you can and will red team yourself. You'll try to fix something by putting up a firewall and that firewall blocks scoring. And red team didn't do anything but the check is down, oh no. Um, I'd say you'd actually probably red team yourself more than red team red teams you uh, sometimes. So uh, if a check goes down, go back. What have you done recently? How might that impact scoring? Uh, do you need to undo something to get check back up? Um, also, don't talk red team. Um, this shout out to whoever was talking shit to red team uh, during red team deploy last night. This one's for you. Um, they'll usually have access to your boxes pretty much no matter what you do. Um, so even if you think you're winning, um, they still have access, they can red board you. Uh, one time, I think it was during IR sec, uh, we had a green board, which means all our checks were up at the very end of competition, um, which is normally when red team tries to take literally everything down, get a completely red board, everything's down. Um, someone said, hey guys, look at our green board a little too loudly, and someone, I think it might have been this man, heard that, and he went into the red team room, uh, turned off a router, and we no longer had a green board. Um, so just keep in mind that uh, if, you, if you say stuff to red team, uh, they will come and they will make you have a bad day. Um, and then just some attention to detail. Uh, learn what things are normal, learn what things are abnormal, um, and then just notice, hey, what is, um, this random five character uh, exe running on my system. Is that normally there? Let me go Google that. Um, and that just comes with um, experience, learning what's normal and what's not. Uh, try to keep a level head. This one's really important. Um, as we saw on the last slide, uh, you're here to have fun. Um, don't get too uh, angry at stuff. Try to, try to like keep your head in the game and not panic or be mean to your teammates because then you're not gonna have fun and that is ultimately one of the main reasons we're all here. Uh, and then make a plan and write it down. Uh, this is from CCDC. Uh, as you can see, we have a few docs that we like to take with us. Uh, so this is us assembling all of our physical paper notes the night before in a random hotel room. Um, what? Yeah, it was, a, it was actually probably the, the day of the competition just like really early. Um, yeah, you don't have to go this crazy, and I don't think you have to print things out for 
um, RIT SEC competitions. But uh, yeah, having plans, having uh, knowing what you're going to do if Red Team does something, or knowing what you're going to do the second you get access to boxes is very useful. Okay, and we're going straight into Windows here. So why would you want to do Windows, and why would you not want to do Windows? Uh, Windows is super, super old. Uh, it's super, super slow, and it's super, super janky. Uh, to me, that makes it fun, because there's always some random, oh, this thing from Windows Vista still works today, and you can just, like, use it. And that's fun to me. Like, you can find stuff that is, no one has thought about in a long time, at least at RIT. Uh, and then you can just pull it out and be like, hey, guys, look at this. Um, Microsoft loves backwards compatibility. So like I was just saying, there's some stuff from like MS-DOS that still works, even though it's very much not secure. Um, because if they turned it off, it might break something. And Microsoft can never break anything ever, unless they do. Um, yeah, so there's just lots of fun tricks that you can learn um, in the OS, and to me that's fun, but I can see why some people would find that super annoying. Um, Windows also has a massive market share. If you go into most companies, they're going to have some Windows boxes that you need to deal with. So you're probably going to have to learn how to deal with Windows at some point. Um, you get a GUI. Uh, graphical user interface. So instead of having to do everything in the terminal, you can have some command line tools to look at and set things up that way. Um, learning the GUI, or learning the command line tools for Windows are useful because sometimes you don't have the GUI, um, but that can be like a really nice way to get into things if you still have the GUI to like look at and learn with. Also, Active Directory is cool. You'll almost always see Active Directory in competitions because it is such a ubiquitous service, and it's a lot of fun to defend. So if you're interested in Active Directory, come to Windows. Sorry. Uh, Windows features, remote access. If you have console access to a box, um, you can turn these off, and you probably should because Red Team is the only one who's going to be using them. Uh, so we have uh, RDP, which is like uh, graphical. Uh, it's basically like you're actually at the terminal. You can see the screen and type stuff, can copy, paste, stuff like that. Um, WinRM is a command line tool that lets, well, you can use it legitimately, but it's usually used by Red Team, let's be real. I don't, there's, it's very few times I've used WinRM when I'm blue teaming. Uh, and SSH, not on by default, but uh, black teams love to turn on SSH on Windows because it's super easy and kind of funny. Um, so if you see uh, open SSH server as an optional Windows feature, yeah, you should probably secure that. Make sure Red Team isn't using that. Uh, Windows services. Uh, so a service is a process that runs in the background. They can be configured to auto start, which makes them amazing for Red Team because it's built in persistence. They don't have to think about it. They just register a service and it's always running. And it'll like auto restart if you go kill the running executable. So this is the services GUI. There's also PowerShell commandlets. Um, look those up. Uh, so a service is different than a scored service. I should probably make the distinction. A scored service is something that is in the scoring engine. You get points if it's up, uh, and you don't get points if it's down. A serv these services are just uh, important operating system tasks or important other tasks. They can contribute to scored services, so don't like come in here and turn everything off. That would probably break the box anyways. Um, but yeah, uh, operating system services, uh, know them, love them, uh, know what's normal, know what's not normal, because uh, Red Team probably will have some malicious services running. And if you don't know what something is, um, go Google it. Uh, it'll usually pop up pretty good results, and you can determine, hey, is this normal or is this Red Team? Uh, you might also see things running under SVC host. Um, those are services. I believe service DLLs run under, run under SVC host by default. Um, yeah. Oh, and I do have the commandlet on here. Uh, git service is the commandlet. So if you run that, it'll show you all, all services. Uh, another Windows feature, uh, group policy. Uh, this is one of the main things that makes Windows cool for corporate environments. You can set uh, settings in a centralized location 
and then AD will just apply those settings to a bunch of boxes in the environment for you. So you don't need an admin to go change two million boxes settings manually, you just change in group policy. Um, so know where things are in here, know how to use it. This is the group policy graphical user interface. Uh, the main things you're gonna wanna know immediately for just like a beginner level is um, these password policies. That's a very common in inject is set password uh, policies like uh, minimum links, stuff like that. So that'll be in group policy. Um, you can go edit that locally and change it. Or you can go to a domain controller and set that for the entire domain. Um, yeah, and just experiment, uh, learn where things are. Uh, there's a lot of cool settings in here. Uh, the firewall, um, know it, love it. Firewalls are amazing for keeping Red Team out. Um, if you don't need a port, why should it be open? Red Team can use it. Uh, so know what your scored services are, know what ports they need, and start firing off, firewalling off things that aren't that or your remote access if you need it. Uh, there are three profiles in Windows, domain, public, private. Um, really, I just do the same thing to all of them because why not? Um, so profiles have settings including configuring logging so you can see if settings are changed, if packets are dropped, stuff like that. And then you can set it up via the GUI or the command line. This is actually one of the uh, instances where I recommend using the command line because I don't really like the GUI, don't tell anyone. Uh, I would also highly recommend a script for this because it's sort of a low hanging fruit, fruit script that's not that hard to do, but it saves you from typing this like 30 times, which always nice. Okay, so now some things that you're gonna wanna know how to do in Windows. Uh, we're gonna start with rotating passwords. Uh, again, change your passwords frequently. Um, if you hear a funny noise, go change your passwords. If you think Red Team's on your box, go change your passwords. Uh, your starting pa passwords are compromised, 100% guaranteed Red Team has those, so make sure to change them pretty quick after you get on the box. Um, passwords can exist for things other than users that you see in the packet. They can be services with passwords, there can be uh, system users with path passwords, uh, and you might have to change them a bunch. If Red Team gets on your box, they get your passwords, uh, you think they have your password for some reason, go change it. Um, here is the command I would recommend using, uh, net user, the username, and then a star will prompt you to type the password when you hit enter. Um, so that's the easiest way to change uh, passwords, in my opinion. There is a GUI for it, but typing net user is faster, in my opinion. Okay, securing users and groups. Again, you're gonna, be, you're gonna use the net command. Uh, net user, you can disable users with that. And net local group will let you view uh, group memberships. So you're gonna wanna look at um, remote desktop users. You're gonna wanna look at administrators. On a domain controller, you're gonna look at the, wanna look at the three types of admins that are on a domain controller, especially uh, domain admins, and lock those down. Uh, you could use local user manager to do this. Again, that's the GUI. I would really recommend uh, the command line tools because they're just so much faster. Um, oh, and users have uh, properties. Some of them are really abusable by Red Team, so make sure you look at those. Um, they can do stuff like store password using reversible encryption and then just go get your passwords. So don't let them do that. I'm skipping this slide. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about SysInternal. SysInternal suite is a suite of tools um, developed by people who aren't Microsoft, but then Microsoft bought them. It's the whole thing. Uh, they're maintained by Microsoft now, so you can get them at live.sysinternals.com. If you go there, you just download whatever you want. That's how I recommend getting them. Uh, we're gonna start with auto runs, which is my favorite sysinternals tool, because you run it as an admin, preferably, and they'll just look in a whole bunch of common uh, persistence locations, and it'll display, hey, this one looks weird, and it'll highlight it in red. So if you see red in here, take a look at it. It's not guaranteed to be malicious, but it's usually bad. That means it's uh, unsigned, I believe. Um, you will also see, this one is legitimate, but if you see CMD, WScript, uh, scripting engines in here, that could also be Red Team doing stuff, because um, they could use that CMD shell to start malware, um, do perform malicious commands, stuff like that. Um, not everything is caught by auto runs, but it is really good. I recommend running it and looking at that. 
uh, just knowing what normal auto runs looks like and how your system's auto runs differs from that will be amazingly helpful. Yeah. Okay, next, Process Explorer. Um, this is basically better Task Manager, if you've ever used Task Manager. Uh, it shows more detailed information about a running process. And uh, one thing I love using it for, you can see loaded DLLs super easily, um, which is very useful if Red Team's doing funky stuff like injecting into running processes. Again, there are limitations. Uh, this is just demonstrating an attack against Process Explorer where you can sort of just <laughs> change it to whatever you want. Um, but I've never seen a Red Team do that. Uh, yeah, just in, in here you're going to want to look for random running processes that aren't normal um, and then see if they're a red team. And finally, process monitor. This one basically just shows you everything that's happening on a system in real time. It's super overwhelming, but you can add filters to it so you can look at specific things you're interested in. Uh, some things that will display uh, registry key modifications, uh, processes starting, stopping, etc. Um, I don't know what PIDs means in, in here. Oh, okay, I misread the, the upper bullet point. Um, so it's really helpful for spotting um, malicious operations, things that Red Team might be doing, but you do need to filter it or it's just super overwhelming. Oh, there's one more I lied. Uh, TCP view just shows all running process, or all running uh, network connections. So if you look at it and you see some random process calling out to redteam.com, uh, then maybe you should look at that. Uh, it refreshes every second by default, but you can change that. And look for weird ports. Uh, you'll see a bunch of weird ports uh, just like uh, communicating, and those might be C2s. Now we're on Linux. All right, now we'll talk about Linux. Um, I don't have a slide saying why to do Linux, but I can say it in one sentence. It's not Windows. And that's what does it for me. Okay, my bad. Um, so yeah, what you should do in your first five minutes for Linux. Um, so a general idea for your five minute plan is proceed in order of how easy things would be to exploit for a red team and how impactful they are. So for example, if you have an admin user with a default password, that is very easy and very strong for a red team to get to. Um, so what you wanna do in the first five minutes Make backups. This is very important. Back up your service files. Back up um, anything that you're planning to change because if you make a change and it breaks it down, then you'll have a backup to revert to. Um, like Asa touched on, rotate all default credentials. They are compromised. So change all passwords for users and services. Um, this is something we got hit for really hard at CCDC. We changed all our passwords for the users, but we didn't change the password for one of our databases, and Red Team was able to use that to um, prevest and take all our stuff down on the second day. Um, firewall, a firewall, like Asa said again, is very important. If you have a good firewall, it will cut off a lot of what Red Team wants to do, and it's pretty easy to set up. Um, so you wanna make sure that only your critical functions are able to communicate. And something we like to call recon is just knowing what's going on on your system. Knowing like what ports are open, what um, terminal sessions are being used, knowing which users you have. Um, this is very important. And focus on locking down remote access. And I'll touch on all of these in the coming slides. So you wanna complete these no matter what before you move on to other things. Like you might have an inject coming in at minute zero and your captain's like, oh guys, we really need to do this inject. But then you need to tell them like, no, um, I need to do this first or else everything is gonna go red. Um, okay, so user and password management. This is very important. So users and shells are kept in slash Etsy slash password. Um, disabled login users typically have bin false or slash user slash bin slash no login as their shell. This is the thing at the very right of their line in Etsy password. Um, so basically if they have like slash bin slash bash or bin sh, or bin ZSH or anything like that, that is a valid user that can log in using a password. Password hashes are kept in Etsy shadow, and these are basically like the hash versions of your passwords. If Red Team is able to get their hands on that, they might be able to crack all your passwords, which is not good. So to change passwords and users, you would use the password and user mod commands. Um, 
this avoids you having to go into the Etsy password file and actually changing it, um, which helps avoid errors. And um, the user mod command is very useful for changing groups, the default shell, or disabling the user. So if you know a user is not being used, you should disable it, because that's one less thing that Red Team can use against you. Um, this is one thing that you should definitely script. It saves you a lot of time from having in to, to go in and type every password for every user again and again. It can just be like, for user in, users.txt, change the password, lock them out. Um, PAM, or plug pluggable authentication modules, is something on Linux that is used for authentication. Um, and it can be manipulated to make passwords irrelevant. So for example, um, there are PAM backdoors, which is like, there will be a malicious PAM module installed that will, for example, automatically authenticate every login attempt. That's bad. You want to make sure that that is hardened. So you want to look for strings null OK and PAM underscore permit dot so in the PAM configs, which are located in slash Etsy slash PAM dot D and just reinstall PAM. Okay, firewalls. Um, so Linux has different distributions and different distributions have different firewalls. Um, so RHEL distributions, so like Fedora and RHEL use firewall D and Debian based distributions like Ubuntu and Debian use UFW or the uncomplicated firewall by default. So know what distribution you're on and know what firewall it uses, this is very important. Firewall D is a zone-based firewall. So what this means is it comes with pre-configured zones that you can um, enable or disable. So there's like public zones, private zones, which all vary in the level of security that they have. Um, so to see what firewall zones are active on your system, the command is firewall, tack, command, tack, tack, get, tack, active, tack, zones. Um, but yeah, be familiar with the firewall commands. And for UFW, it's a lot easier it's called the uncomplicated firewall for a reason. Um, and the commands you need to know are basically just enable, disable, allow, deny. So it's just like UFW allow port 22. And that's all you would need to do. Um, IP tables and NF tables are more advanced. Um, you can do a lot more with them, but it's a lot harder to get the hang of. Because in these, you have to like set the order of the rules in which they apply. And there's different tables that you have to look at. Um, and do keep in mind that things that you set in UFW will show up in IP tables, but things that you do in IP tables may not necessarily show up in UFW. So, yeah. Um, hardening. So the easiest way in for Red Team, like we've said, is default credentials. Make sure you change your passwords. Another thing is update your services. If you have a version of a web server that is from 2008, it probably has a lot of easy vulnerabilities that Red Team can use against you. Um, another very important thing is open remote services. So these would be things like Secure Shell, VNC, or Remote Desktop. You will rarely be using VNC or Remote Desktop on Linux. You should be able to disable those. SSH you need to be more careful with because this one is a lot more common. Um, if you have, for example, a cloud box that you don't have console access to, you would need to use SSH. But even if you are using that, you want to limit access as much as possible. For example, if you know, oh, I'm only using this user blue team, that means I can disable um, every other user from logging in using SSH. And if you know that you're using an SSH key to log in, you can disable, or if you're not using SSH keys to log in, you can disable pub key authentication. And if you are, you can disable password authentication. Basically, the idea behind this is making it so that only you have access using SSH. And if you're only using one user, um, add it to an allow list. SSH comes with allow lists, so you can just add at the bottom of the config file, allow, allow users blue team, and um, only the blue team user will be able to log in. So the root account and SUIDs. Um, the file etsy sudoers states who can use sudo and what they can do with it. So for example, if you see a line saying red team can use sudo, that's not good, you wanna get rid of that line. Um, SUIDs are a thing that Linux has that allows users to execute files as the owner of the file. So this is important for certain functionalities in Linux, but there's some that you don't want it um, to use. So for example, if you have a file editor like Nano or Vim that has an SUID bit, that means anyone can run it as root, which means they can run like Nano Etsy Shadow and it'll run as root, which means they can see any file in the system, which is bad.
Um, and then recon. Recon is very important because if red team knows your system and your network better than you do, you've already lost. So um, you should know as much as possible about your infrastructure. Like before the competition, review your packet to know what's running and what needs to be running. Check for what operating systems you have, check for what services you have. These will all help you prepare and get to know your infrastructure better. Um, so some things you wanna look for. These are basically very common things that Red Team loves to use against you. SSH keys, check for um, authorized keys in any user's home directory and in Root's home directory. Because if Root has an SSH key that Red Team has set up, that means they can SSH in to your system as root and have remote access to run anything as root. Also look for open ports. So the commands netstat, ss, nmap, any of these will be very helpful for um, figuring out what network services you have exposed. And so for example, if you have like a random port, like 1337 exposed, hey, that's probably not good. I don't think any of my critical services use port 1337. I should block that off using a firewall. Uh, PS is very helpful for looking for running processes. Um, so this is how you could catch, for example, a red team tool running. And um, red team also likes to use system D services to automatically run things on your system. So look for any running system CTL services. And this is another thing that's very important to know what is, um, what is supposed to be there, what looks ordinary, and what is out of the ordinary. And similar with scheduled tasks. So um, cron tabs are how you schedule tasks in Linux. Um, and those two locations, slash etsy slash cron and var spool cron cron tabs are two very common locations for scheduled tasks. So you wanna check those locations for anything that's out of the ordinary. All right, um, and then threat hunting. Threat hunting is probably what you will be doing for a lot of the competition. So revisit all of the recon commands regularly um, in the last slide to check for new activity, whether it be ports, services, processes, or users. The command w, literally just one keystroke w, um, lists all logged in users and sessions. So you can kill a terminal uh, process for any user that is not you using the pkill command. Use tools to help you. Wireshark and NetHogs are very good tools for looking at network traffic. Um, if you have taken basically like a lot of the CSEC courses or any of the CSEC courses here, you know what Wireshark is. NetHogs is like a net top tool, which lets you look at like how much traffic is being sent by which process or which port. Snoopy is another really cool one that logs basically any command executions. So these are good tools to use that will help you find um, activity. Um, this find command um, will let you look for any recently modified files. So the tech admin 10 is basically look for anything that was modified in the last 10 minutes. And only run what is absolutely necessary. This is very important. Like if you're running a database server or a web server, why do you have a file share? That's just another thing that Red Team can take advantage of. Um, so make sure you're only running what is necessary and also be familiar with log files because those are very helpful for threat hunting and troubleshooting. All right, um, the services or what is actually scored. Be familiar with common services you might see. These include SSH, which is remote access, um, web servers, mail servers, file servers, and databases. It is also very important to be with systems D and journal CTL. Um, if you know how to use these, it will make troubleshooting a lot easier when something goes down. So why do your services actually go down? Breaks are usually quite easy and quite simple. Um, and by usually, I mean, except for the last hour when Red Team turns your whole box into Tetris or Flappy Bird, the breaks will usually be like, oh, I'm just gonna turn the service off. Um, so like if the service was just turned off, turn it back on. If the service's port was blocked by a firewall, unblock the port. Um, a lot of the times Red Team will mess with you by messing with the configuration of the service. So for example, if you're hosting a web server, the web server will usually score for the existence of a file or the contents of a file, and Red Team will move that. So for example, like if you're scored on index.html, Red Team can rename that index.htm and your score check will go down. Another thing is changing the permissions of files. So for example, if the service can't see its config file, it'll go down. Um, and again, change the password and scoring. So this is where you need to be familiar with logs to know what's wrong. 
And the most likely reason a service is down is because of something you did. Uh, remember what you did right before the service went down? And that is probably why it's down. So this is a relatively new thing in blue team comms, but in lieu of traditional networking, which you might have seen, um, now everything is in the cloud and not in the sky, but in some data center somewhere, I guess. So there are um, three big cloud providers, AWS, Azure, and GCP, which is Google. Um, recently, CCDC has moved onto AWS, so that's what we'll be covering. There's over 100 services in AWS, but these five are the common ones that are applicable to pretty much every scenario. So S3, which is short for simple storage solution, these are like virtual storage spaces, like think of Google Drive, just stuff to store files in the cloud. I am identity and access management, which there was a lovely presentation, um, education with James and Braden. I am go review that. EC2 Elastic Cloud Compute. This is where all your machines are going to be hosted. So, think VMs, virtual machines. CloudWatch CloudTrail is how you monitor AWS services across an account. Um, and the logs it generates are only for AWS services, not things inside boxes. You have to go inside a machine to view those associated logs. And VPC, which stands for Virtual Private Cloud, is how you do networking. So what, well, how do you defend a cloud infrastructure? Um, kind of, it's, it's exactly the same as defending any traditional infrastructure hosted on traditional networking. But you're gonna start with checking the user's accounts and passwords. Obviously change all of them. Um, AWS has a lovely graphical console. Um, they do offer command line interfaces, but it's so nice to have the console. Everything's, all you can see all the users, how long They've, how long since they last changed the password and when they've last logged in. So obviously change it when you first get into comp and if you see any mysterious logins, make sure to go ahead and change that again. Um, make sure you're really emphasizing the principle of least privilege, which is only giving users the bare minimum they need to do their jobs. So in these competitions, you'll have scenarios of employees in various departments like sales. There's no reason a person in sales should have administrative access to the main database. So more on auditing users. AWS has a, a really handy tool where you can um, analyze the policies attached to every user. Um, every policy in AWS is a simple JSON file that explicitly says allow services to X resources. So make sure that if people are not using all of the policies attached to them, that you remove it. So back to logging. Uh, like I said, uh, CloudWatch and CloudTrail logs only audit stuff in the AWS account, and they do need to be enabled for every individual service. But they can tell you a lot. Like here, we see they're obtaining credentials to a database and then exfiltrating them. That's probably not good, especially if it says passwords. So that tells us, okay, we need to secure our database. And the so CloudWatch is the logging structure, and then CloudTrail is how you can, AWS can tell you, hey, link these associated events together into something called a trail. So anything related to the database will be in one trail. Anything related to, say, accessing your EC2 instances, your VMs, can be in another trail. Again, but they all need to be activated, and they can be deactivated by Red Team, so just make sure they're always enabled. So I just threw a bunch of stuff at you like, whoa, 
EC2 instances and whoa, Cloud Watch, Cloud Shred, why, how do these relate to each other? Um, Capital One was breached via their AWS account and Red Team used a similar attack in CCDC for the past two years in a row. Um, the way this works is that every VM or EC2 instance, you can grab the metadata by just curling it. Curl is a command line tool to get information about uh, something on the web. But insecure um, policies, basically when you log into, and if you're trying to access a resource on the web that's hosted on AWS, you might, sometimes you might see it redirects you to an AWS account. This is called federating into an account via an IEM user. So if you see it get, you get redirected and then your resource shows up, you just logged into an AWS account. Basically, there was an over-permissive policy that allowed unauthorized users to get in. Um, IMDS is instant metadata service. It was associated with every EC2 instance. So version one, um, as long as you're logged into an AWS account, you can get the metadata for any VM, but version two allows you, uh, requires further authentication, like are they in this list that say, says they can access the metadata? And in this data, there's actually the login for the AWS account, which is really problematic because if Red Team gets access to that, then they can log into your console and shut everything out, which is actually what happened. So just make sure that you are applying your, your IAM policies, you're enabling all the security services, and you're enabling logging for the AWS account. Um, most, of, most of what the cloud world does is kind of just looking at logs and then responding to, to any vulnerabilities. But um, a big thing with, now that we have cloud in blue team competitions, how do you handle networking? Uh, it's pretty much the same thing as traditional networking. We can, it's in your VPC settings. You'll still set up firewall rules. Uh, exactly the same, and it's just that you don't have access to a physical switch and router. So since networking is exactly the same in the cloud, we're gonna hand it off to Mr. Networking himself. All right, so finally, I promise we're almost over. Uh, we have routers, firewalls, and injects. So uh, a lot of the time, uh, there's going to be other parts of the competition, like in this case, a router or a specific hypervisor like VMware or Proxmox or things like that, that might not necessarily be scored, but a lot of other things rely on. So for a lot of the competitions you'll see here, you'll get a PFSense router. That PFSense router will never be scored. However, there is at least all of your LAN boxes, if not more, behind it. So if that ever goes down, all of your LAN boxes are now not being scored, so that's probably eight boxes that you're losing points on every minute or so because that router is down. So for CCDC, they shifted over to cloud for RITSEC. 99% of the time we're doing PFSense because it's the easiest one to use. Um, yeah, It's much different than traditional Linux and Windows, you're going to have to use some different skills than what you typically would do for those. So just play around with them is probably the best idea. So uh, Blue Router, this is what you guys are going to see all the time pretty much is going to be PFSense. Uh, it's FreeBSD based. I've covered it before and I have a talk in like two hours that's going to cover all of this. Uh, similar to Linux, just problematic with a lot of other stuff. Uh, there's two ways to access it, is SSHing in or using the web GUI. So there's a, it has a website that you can poke through. Uh, yeah, and like I said, if this goes down or somebody puts a firewall rule up that doesn't block, block things properly, you're at least down eight boxes, if not all of them, depending on how the network is configured. So it's, it's not scored, but it's as important, if not more important, to focus your attention on this box, because otherwise you will just 
potentially lose. Um, another point, I know everybody here has talked about firewalls, but they're very important. Every box that you will get will have firewall rules on them. It's very important, and honestly, if you get your firewall rules down to a good point, you don't need to be rotating passwords because red team will just be incapable of walking in. Odds are you're not going to be able to do that, but you can get halfway there where you're kicking red team out 90% of the time and you're protecting yourself a lot more. Uh, like they've talked about before, it's entirely OS and distribution dependent. Linux has IP tables, UFW, Firewall D, Windows has uh, firewall, Windows firewall, PFSense has PFCTO and easy rules, and cloud is kind of up to the cloud provider. Uh, yeah, here's the web config. I'll talk about it later, so we're not gonna go over this super much. But it's important to, if you're playing around with the router, set it up, poke around with it, have some fun. And skip the next one. All right, so now we're on to Injex. So Injex are probably gonna be about 30% of the competition you're gonna be working on, 30, 20 to 30, depending on what, where you're at. Um, so a lot of the times these are just tasks that you have to do given to you by the black team. Um, so you're gonna, you have to do them, and it's highly recommended that you do do them, because it is, again, 20 to 30%. The CCDC team in the past has won because they're just that good at injects, and other teams just did not do them. So as a result, they just would never, they would always win because the other teams were missing out on 20, 30% of the competition itself. Uh, it's supposed to be professional dependent, however that changes depending on the comp. A lot of the times comps will have very specific outlines for what they're looking for, who you should be addressing, such and such. Uh, another important thing is write the business impact down. So if it's uh, if you don't wanna do something because the inject seems very suspicious, just write down and be like, hey, this might shut down our service. We shouldn't do this. And that's a perfectly valid excuse as well. Um, should be professional, like I said, have an executive summary, talk about what the inject is, what it was looking for, what you did to go along with it. Uh, give the detailed information about what the inject was looking for, provide screenshots and things like that. Uh, and then you can have an appendix. A lot of the time, the comps are just fine with you just throwing it in with the information itself. Uh, here's an example inject from CCDC. Uh, so they were given a Kubernetes cluster in the past that they had to quote unquote upgrade um, to the newest version. Um, so there, they provided screenshots of them providing it, the version being updated, things like that. They talk about what? Screenshots. labeled screenshots, which CCDC likes, but we, you don't have to do unless you're in professional competitions. Um, they talk about in the left side, like we've updated it, the clear address and the thank you, things like that, labeled, it gives all the information you need. That's how you get full credit on an inject. Uh, inject two, um, especially in our IT set competitions and other ones that we do, we're not gonna be as formal and half the time they're gonna be just for fun so they're not gonna be as serious. Like here, they were told to take a lunch break. So they took a lunch break, they took a photo of them eating lunch, things like that. Nothing technical, but it still counts as an inject, so you might as well do it. It's free points, and if you don't do it, you're just losing out on a bunch of stuff. So there's gonna be goofy injects. Still do them. A lot of the time, we give them to you guys so that you have fun with it, and you're not just staring blankly at a computer screen for eight hours straight. Nobody wants to do that. It's not fun. So here uh, we're just pointing out that um, we kind of we kind of screwed up. And if you look at the picture, we actually have an open console right there. Um, so I think we actually lost points for that because we leaked sensitive information on that screen. Um, yeah. So just make sure you keep in mind what you're turning in for injects. Sometimes red teams will have access to the injects. Like sometimes you'll get an inject that's like, "Hey guys, 
make a make an administrator account that's uh, administrator and the password is password and give them access to everything. So uh, definitely don't turn off your security brain when you're doing Nginx. Um, they will ask you to do bad things sometimes and uh, information in Nginx can be given to Red Team. Now, that's not saying don't do the Nginx if they're like that. Give a response. Just say you don't wanna do it for these valid security reasons. Do not just skip over it because that's just losing points on an inject. A lot of people in the past will see the obviously fake or bad inject and just not do it. Uh, just give a, give a brief response back being like, hey, we're not gonna do this. It's not secure. Somebody might get access to it, things like that. Um, so since we're coming up on IRSAC, uh, another very important thing you're gonna have to do towards the end of the competition is write an incident response report. So what's that? It's gonna be pretty much a massive document that labels all the different incidents that you guys encountered. So, hey, you noticed red team changed the password here. Hey, there was a red team user here. There was a service that was malicious, things like that. When you're in the competition, screenshot everything you find that may be bad and store it somewhere. You're gonna need to write about it in your incident response plan and it's that, I think that incident response plan is worth another 30% of your grade. So if you don't do good on that, not great. Now don't just go around screenshotting everything because you will get points off for that, but it's highly recommended if you know that there's, oh, okay. Uh, so if you know that it's red team, take a screenshot of it, write it down, write down when you found it, what it was doing, things like that, and then at the end of the comp, you'll have like an hour to write an incident response report throw it in there, you'll get points for it. We have red team come in and verify the information you gave is correct. You can also do this for CCDC, you actually get points back for uh, if a red team successfully attacks you, you get points back if you successfully find the, how they did the attack and show that you've mitigated it for the future. So. All right, um, so some final tips. Uh, the basic, how do I win? Maintain service uptime and do injects. It's kind of in the packet. These are the things you scored on. Um, know your network, know your systems, and know your services. This is like, we keep talking about, look for something abnormal. This requires you to know what is normal. Um, so like, go through practice run-throughs, make sure you know what everything is supposed to look like. Another thing is know your team and know your role. Um, organize your team by strengths and weaknesses, by responsibilities, and um, by leadership. A well-organized team that communicates well is always going to do a lot better and have a lot more fun time. Um, and the principle is like least privilege, but keep your systems and users doing only what they are meant to do. Do not like have overprivileged users or security groups. These are the easiest wins for a red team and prepare as much as possible, have a five minute plan ready, have a hardening uh, plan ready, have threat hunting and incident response playbooks. These will be very helpful for keeping things organized during competitions. Automate as much as possible. So this is like writing scripts for changing passwords or setting up a firewall. Um, and do the simple stuff first. We all touched on like what a five minute plan is supposed to look like, but we cannot reiterate this enough. Change your passwords. If you have a default credential on day two, red team is going to feast on you. Uh, write stuff down or you will forget. Um, so write down things you did, like, hey, I did this and then the service went down. Oh, it's okay, I have notes I can look back to and I'll just fix that. Um, and some things you can look into, like principles are preventative and detective controls and defense in depth. Um, and then here are a bunch of resources that have been compiled uh, over the years. I'm not really gonna talk about all of them, but these are great things to look into for starting your research.